Hey everybody, welcome to episode 88 of Tuesdays with Perry. We're going to get Perry on the line in just a second. Uh, Tonight we're going to be talking about, obviously, the DNC, the Democratic National Convention. We're going to talk about Kamala Harris price controls, the Palestinian activists and their anti-Semitism. We're also going to talk about whether or not Kamala Harris knew about Joe's mental decline and how covering it up makes her culpable in a coup. And we may talk briefly about Tim Walz and the fact that he's being investigated for his relationship with the Chinese Communist Party. All right, let's get um, Perry on the line. Hello? Hey, Perry, welcome to the podcast today. Uh, Thanks for joining me today. It is episode 88 of Tuesdays with Perry. How are you, uh, my brother? Are you there? Um, Are you there? I'm here wherever here is. (laughs) All right. Well, well, thanks for joining me. Why don't we start with Kamala Harris? Um, Let's talk a little bit about her background. She's a relatively relatively unknown to the electorate at large. Uh, Some people know she was the vice president, but she supposedly met with Joe Biden every Wednesday for lunch, and she didn't notice a mental decline of Joe Biden. What's your take on that? Well, um, it's kind of like she's claiming to be Deaf, blind, and dumb. And uh, we already know she's dumb. (laughs) Um, But the fact that she's claiming she's blind as well as deaf because she didn't, well, she hasn't asked the question, but going on the assumption that if somebody in the press actually gave a damn about the truth, and was asked the question, you've been politically tied to this man for the past four years, going back to the presidential campaign of 2020. You claim to be sitting alongside him, enjoying a lunch in the White House every Wednesday for the past three and a half years. How is it that the average Joe Schmuckatelli who doesn't have direct access to the president knows that Joe Biden is an empty husk of a human being stumbling and bumbling and fumbling around every day, but you don't. And if you are saying that you haven't noticed any decline in his mental capabilities over the past four years, then how can we trust you with being the chief executive officer of the United States of America. And since she made made it public within the last three days that she will not uh, consider doing a debate on Fox, other than Trump, who is it that's going to ask you that question? So which is it? Are you, in fact, as dumb as a box of rocks? Or are you assuming that the vast majority of Americans are? It's one or the other. There's no way that any human being with with an IQ above 99 can't see what is obvious. So, um, look, Rudy. This is the game that they've been playing on the American people, not for three and a half years, but for four years. This is the reason why we have to do everything in our power as citizens of this country to see to it. She doesn't assume the title of president because she's incapable of holding the office. Yeah. She's another empty suit, uh, empty pants suit. She's an empty suit, much like Joe Biden was an empty suit. 
Uh, but Joe Biden had been in politics for for 50 years. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Kamala Harris only served as a uh, United States senator for only two terms. Is that correct? No, two years. She only served as senator for two years. That's correct. Just like <laughs> Barack Obama. Oh, I think he served four of his six years. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. So she she would never be able to win office in a purple or red community. The reason that she successfully ran and held the office of district attorney is because of downtown Willie Brown. The same thing can be said for why she made it to attorney general of the state of California. Again, it was because of downtown Willie Brown. And to a large extent, he helped her make it to senator as well. And I'm sure he had something to do with her getting the nod to be vice president. So, you know, when when people like us say she's accomplished nothing, we're probably doing her a service because what she has done as an elected official throughout her career has been disastrous. Just look at what happened to the city of San Francisco while she was DA. She furthered her goals to create havoc and mayhem as attorney general. And, I mean, she was more concerned about locking up black men for selling uh, pot on street corners than she was about convicting violent criminals. Um, So that catapulted her because of the politics of the state of California to that of Senator. What did she do while she was Senator? Did she sponsor and bill? Maybe she signed on, you know, as a co-sponsor. I don't know of any bills that she wrote and asked people to co-sign. So, how did she get to where she is? The same way Hildebeest did. Right. And that's very typical of Democrats. They don't have to prove anything. All they have to do is look good and yeah. sound good. And and that's how their constituency supports them. Yeah. Um, well, she does she, she does not really yeah. sound very good and her uh, policy pro- proposals are awful price gouging. Do you really think it's businesses that are price gouging and now she wants to put in price controls if she's elected? I mean, she could do that right now if she wanted, but that everybody says that that would be disastrous because I have doubts that there's even price gouging going on. Well, before we even get to her foolish statement because it'll never be policy. Her foolish statement about, you know, people like Kroger and Publix and Grand, I don't think Grand Union's still around, but you get the picture. You have, throughout the country, there are large grocery store chains, routes out in California. The fact that she makes the comment that retailers and to a greater extent, producers of grocery products are gouging, goes to show either A, how inept she is at understanding market economics, and B, how stupid she thinks the people who would most likely vote for her are when it comes to understanding that a market-driven economy is what dictates what the price of a loaf of bread is. And the other thing that dictates what the price of that loaf of bread is, is how many dollars are chasing that loaf of bread. And when you print monopoly money, as much as she and Joe Biden have done over the past three and a half years, and you flood the market with useless dollars, that is what drives the cost of goods up that as well as demand. But demand shrinks when people don't have enough dollars in their wallet to buy that loaf of bread. I have said on more than a couple of occasions on your podcast, you know, my wife and I make a a fairly decent living, okay? Um, When I have to put things back on the shelf because I know I don't have enough money 
to pay for everything that I want at BJ's or Costco or Sam's, which is where I do the bulk of my grocery shopping. When an entire, when filling one cart in any one of those big box stores costs me on average between five and six hundred dollars, that that is something that I don't have a control over. And I say all the time, if I, someone of elevated age, you know, I don't have school age children anymore. I only have to worry about my my household, my property, uh, my better half, and myself. If I have to worry about deciding whether or not I should buy that loaf of bread or buy eggs, because I don't have money for both, how in the world is somebody who's blue collar and making anywhere between half and two thirds of what I make for a living and has the responsibility of raising one, two or more children, how in the world are they doing it? And there's only two people that have to be blamed for why Joe Schmuckatelli, who works 40 or more hours a week to try and keep a roof over his head and that of his family, there's only two people that deserve to be blamed for why that poor guy that works hard every day, plays by the rules, can't pay for his groceries and gas on the same day. And that is Kamala Harris and Joe Biden. And to simply say to people who are who are more than likely going to vote for you, I have the answer. And the answer is price controls. When you say that to those people, and many of them nod their head, you're going to have to answer to those people when not only they can't afford to buy that loaf of bread, but the loaf of bread isn't on that shelf anymore. And that's exactly what has happened historically with socialist uh, economic policy, which is exactly why the Soviet Union collapsed. It is also why people, as you and I speak tonight in Venezuela, are in the middle of a civil war because the only people that have full bellies in Caracas, Venezuela tonight are Maduro, his wife, and the people in the presidential palace because everybody else in Caracas is starving. And when people starve, they always blame the people who are in charge. Now, up to this point, Kamala has been able to fool people because, of course, she doesn't have to answer any questions from, from the press because the press, I think you even quoted one, one of the talking heads. We don't have to ask her any questions. <laughs> so until she has to answer tough questions as to why it is the average American today is worse off than they were when she came to power three and a half years ago, until that question is asked of her, she's going to continue to say, I have the answer. But the fact of the matter is you've been in office for three and a half years. Why haven't you instituted those policies in the three and a half years you've been in office? And don't tell me it's because you were vice president because you have supported those very policies that have put the average American into the poorhouse right now. So that's just as bad as being on the on on the second chair when it came to those policies being instituted. Because you're certainly not speaking out against them. You're just simply saying, "I have a better way." Well, if you have a better way, then why don't you institute those plans now? Why don't you go to your boss who has said, "Okay, I know I can't win re-election, so I'm going to give you the nod," which is, by the way, very anti-democratic. But put that aside for a second. Why don't you go to your boss who did all this to the average American and say, hey, Joe, I need some help from you. I need you to institute price control. Let's get a start on this right now so I can win on November 5th. How come you haven't gone to Uncle Joe and insisted he come up with a plan similar to what it is you are now saying you will institute on day one? You know why? 
because you know it won't work. You're only saying it to placate the people that you absolutely need to vote for you. Because all you have to do, you know, history is a great teacher. And if you go back to the early 1970s, following Nixon's reelection, it was either in 1973 or early 1974 before he stepped down due to Watergate, he instituted price controls. And the funny thing about those price controls, Rudy, he told people like butchers, okay, you can only sell chopped meat and steak at these prices per pound. So what happened? Well, the ranchers certainly weren't going to lower the price for a head of cattle. So the butcher, in order to remain in business, knowing that a pound of, let's just say, for the sake of this discussion, uh, a, a, a one pound um, sirloin steak was three dollars a pound it cost that butcher in order to put it in a package and serve it over the counter to his customer that three dollar a pound retail price had a profit margin of somewhere around 30 to 60 cents and now that same three dollar piece of meat that he was selling for three dollars is now costing him 450 so why is a butcher, if he still wants to stay in business and feed his own family, why is a butcher going to sell a piece of meat that costs him four fifty at three dollars a pound when the government says you can't sell it for more than three dollars a pound? Guess what happened? He stopped selling that type of meat. And that is exactly what happened. And that's where the steak cut Delmonico came in to be. There was no such cut as a Delmonico cut in 1972, but it suddenly arrived in 1973 or 74, whenever, whenever the price controls were instituted. Guess what? There was plenty of Delmonico uh, cuts that you could buy at four, five, six dollars a pound, but you sure as hell couldn't buy a ribeye anymore because it wasn't in the case. It was called something else. And that's the way people in the white market, because there's a white and black market, people in the white market were able to stay in business. Kamala Harris wants to do the same thing in 2025 that Nixon failed at in the early 1970s. So does she really think that's going to work? And oh, by the way, you also have freeze wages. So how is the guy who's driving a bus making $25, $30 an hour going to feel about that when inflation continues to go up? And why does inflation continue to go up, Rudy? Oh, that's right. Because you keep printing worthless dollar bills that now even the Chinese don't want to buy. And that's going to further inflate the cost of goods. So this policy that she's claiming she'll institute is never going to happen, even if, God forbid, she were to win. It's never going to happen. No. So, again, that question is not being asked of her because the press isn't interested in asking her any questions of substance because that would only hurt her because she can't talk off a, a teleprompter every time she opens her mouth she makes herself look like the moron that she is. Yeah. So the dual, you know, the duality that, that, of democracy, it is both strong <laughs> and fragile. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of thought that's where you were going with that. Uh, yeah. But I'd like to go uh, somewhere else really quick. We, we were talking about uh, Kamala's constituency and one of her constitu constituents is the Palestinian activist. And so there's been growing anti-Semitism on the left. How does she reconcile all this? I mean, is she going to make a play um, for the Palestinian vote? Because I know they're not happy with what Joe Biden's doing and they're sure as hell not going to support Donald Trump. Um, what, what do you think? Cause well, appa apparently the, this, this fall 
or as soon as college begins classes that the activists are going to start up protesting again. Well, they already said they're going to. And, and a lot of those activists are, are ruling the streets of downtown Chicago as you and I speak. Yeah. You know, uh, I don't know how much the press is covering it because quite frankly, I'm not listening to the press. I'm getting most of my news off of X right now. Um, and what, what video I have seen has been eye-opening. The police are having a very difficult time keeping things under control. Um, they supposedly erected even more difficult fencing, which is another thing that makes me kind of chuckle. Kamala Harris is one of those who says fences and walls don't work. Well, if they don't work, why is it you've got all this protective fencing running around United Center right now? And why have you fortified that fencing? And why do you have more police standing guard around that fencing if it doesn't work? Hmm? That's not a question that's been put to her yet. Yeah. Yeah, she doesn't want to build And them. why is that important? Why is that important to point out? It's important to point out because even though everyone in the, in the press and in her party is now done an about face three years later, she is the borders are. I don't care if she likes the term or not. The fact of the matter is you were put in charge of the border by your boss, Joe Biden, in 2021. It took you many months and a lot of cajoling on the part of the, of the media to get you to at least go to the border. And, of course, you picked the part of the border where nobody was coming across because that's not where the people were coming. So if fences and walls don't work and you're the border czar and we have in the last three years – Anywhere, anywhere between 18 and 30 million illegal aliens running around in the streets of the United States. Why is that? Because it certainly wasn't happening in the last 18 months of Trump's first administration. So if you can't even do one thing right, how in the world are you going to multitask as the president of the most powerful nation on earth. Yeah. So going nobody's back, asked her that question. Going back to my question though, do you think that she is going to kowtow to the Palestinian activists, the anti Semites uh, in the party? She has given them um she has given them some room and she is trying to uh negotiate for their cause. Um do you think that these Palestinian activists are going to have some sway over the Democratic Party if Kamala Harris wins? Well, they already have sway. They've, they've gotten what they want. But here's the thing. When you have terrorists making demands and you placate to those demands, eventually they have more demands. And now that she has over the past few months uh, said, I'm with you. Now she has to prove to them she is with them. How does she do that? Oh, she tells Bibi Netanyahu, stop and start negotiating. That's her way of, of, of um, giving the terrorists what they want. Okay. And that's not going to, to satisfy them at this point. What they want is surrender and nothing less. They're not going to get that. She has no choice but to continue to try and walk that very narrow fence that she's put herself on. And she, she and her advisors are, are of the opinion that, well, where else are the Palestinian supporters is going to go. They're not going to go to Trump because Trump stands with Israel. So I can only do so much without offending pseudo-Jews and um, atheistic 
Americans who don't really give a damn about what happens in the Middle East on either side. So she's, she's really painted herself into a corner. And, and that's the reason why the Palestinian protesters are out in force running the streets of, of uh, Chicago right now. She really has nowhere else to go. And because the press is not challenging her on, on her moves regarding that, that issue, she's getting away with it for now. It won't last. The, the honeymoon will come to an abrupt end probably after this coming weekend. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, we only got a couple of minutes left. So apparently uh, James Comer and the House Republican Oversight Committee is launching an investigation into Tim Walls, who is the vice presidential running mate for Kamala Harris, with his connection of receiving money from the Chinese Communist Party. Do you know anything about this or you want to comment on this? Well, I mean, they are socialists, you know, so... <laughs> Here, here's here's the thing about him having made what over forty trips to uh, to China. Let me rephrase that to communist China because I don't think he ever went to Taiwan. He just went to mainland China. So obviously, he has an affinity for totalitarian governments, beginning with the Chinese. Um, he likes how they control their population, and he wants to celebrate that. What better way than to bring a, a disaffected young Americans, high school and college students, to Beijing to show them, see, this is how a government works. And, you know, I, I guess I, I'm not really concerned so much about the fact that he made that many trips as I am not getting clarification as to why he made so many trips. Number one, number two, somebody paid him to do that. My guess is, and I'm pretty, and I've heard rumors to this effect, and I'm sure that is the case. The communist Chinese are the ones who gave him the money. That, that was the way he sold these, uh, student exchange trips um, to bring kids from the United States to communist China. So he obviously has a very close relationship on a number of fronts with the communist Chinese. And based on how he has run his state of Wisconsin, um, I'm sorry, Minnesota, I'm not surprised because if you look at the way he bungled uh, the riots, uh, the George Floyd riots, he was asked uh, by both the chief of police of Minneapolis and the sheriff of Minneapolis County for help. That help was, we need National Guardsmen brought into Minneapolis to make sure things don't get out of hand. Well, just like line walking Lawton, and Kathleen Blanco with the hurricanes of, of past, he sat on his hands for four days and allowed black businesses to burn to the ground instead of acting in a timely manner to see to it that these so-called mostly peaceful protests never got violent. He waited until black businessmen and women were burned out of their business before he distributed any guardsmen, and I think they were, I think six to 8,000 guardsmen were requested, and he waited four days to send in 1,000 right. after the city had burned to the ground. Yeah. So, again, this is what totalitarians do. This is how they gain more control over the average person. They make you dependent on them. This is what he has in store for the United States of America. God forbid he ever makes it to the vice president's mansion. Yeah, let's hope. Let's hope That's not. what I think of him. And, and you know something? We don't have to look any further than the men who served with him in the National Guard 25 years ago, who have, not, to a man, not one of these men who served in, in the Army, have anything positive 
to say about good old Timmy boy. Yeah. He's a coward. He's a shiv. And he's, to a certain extent, a liar. <laughs> and he's trying to portray himself as a man of the people, and he's anything but. And the truth about him is going to come out as the days go forward. And I'm looking forward to no matter who it is that uh, hosts the vice presidential debate, because J.D. is going to take advantage of whatever time he's given to point out what a criminal this POS Tim Waltz really is. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I can't wait to hear some more about Kamala Harris. If we ever hear more about Kamala Harris, we might not before the election. We'll see. Um, I appreciate you joining me tonight, Perry. I think we're going to call it there because it's uh, 10 o'clock. But I appreciate you joining me tonight and uh, of this kind of truncated version of Tuesdays with Perry, episode 88. Um, Thanks for joining me, and I'll talk to you next week. Sounds good, Rudy. Look forward to it. All right, man. Have a good night. You too. Take care now. See ya. There goes Perry. Um, Episode 88, Tuesdays with Perry. Uh, It was kind of a truncated version. It was only about half an hour, maybe 25 minutes. Uh, We talked about price controls and whether Kamala Harris knew about Joe Biden's mental decline because that's why he was stepping down because he was going to lose because everybody was... It was apparent of his condition and nobody was going to vote this guy back into office knowing of his mental decline. And um, so we'll see what the election brings. Um, We'll see what happens with these so, quote unquote, price controls that Kamala Harris wants. Uh, She could put it into place right now if she wanted to. And we'll see what comes of um, the investigation into Tim Walsh and whether they find out he's a secret communist or not. Right, so for me, uh, thanks for joining me, everybody. Don't forget to like, subscribe, leave a comment. Join us next week for episode 89 of Tuesdays with Perry or join me tomorrow morning for an episode of Rudy's Revelation at live at 10 a.m. on Rumble. Peace out.